All right, this morning I want to focus in on that latter passage there at the very end of Luke chapter 10, the story about Martha starting there in verse number 38. We'll just re-read this really quickly. The Bible says, Now it came to pass as they went they, that they entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bitter, therefore, that she helped me. Now, before I even continue any further, uh, this is that Martha and Mary, who also had their brother Lazarus, and Lazarus was the one that was raised back from the dead. And we saw in that story, that's the same passage where it says Jesus wept, right? He was sad over all the people who were grieving the loss of Lazarus. And he loved Lazarus. He loved Martha. He loved Mary. They were, they were closer friends to his in the ministry just in general. We get that sense from reading the Bible from other passages as well. And here we see Martha is... She's serving, right? So there, there, there's, there's other people there. She's being a good hostess. She's uh, working real hard and, and trying to provide everything for the people that are there. And her sister Mary isn't helping her, right? So she's got this company over. Jesus is there. We assume there's probably some disciples there, some other people. And Martha's scurrying around, trying to make sure everyone's cared for and do all this work as you would when you're hosting people at your house, and she's getting a little irritated because she doesn't have the help of her sister. Right? I think we've all probably been there before where someone else in your family, or you're doing a bunch of work, and, and you're looking to be like, man, what are they doing? They're just sitting over there. You're supposed to be over here helping me. We got, we got guests, right? We need, we, need to, um, we need to help here. And, you know, there's a few things that... Before I even get into what Jesus responds to her with, you know, the Bible teaches us that we ought to be, one, hospitable, right? So, so being, uh, providing for people that come into your house, it's a, it's a very good quality. It's something that's taught in Scripture that we all ought to be hospitable to people that, you know, to strangers as well as to friends. And when they enter into your house, to, be, to take care of them. And also that we ought to be hard workers, right? There's, there's plenty of evidence in scripture you look at the book of proverbs especially on how christians how believers especially ought to be hard workers absolutely definitely the men you know that that men are supposed to be providers for their family and uh you know especially those of their own household but also ladies as well are supposed to be hard workers they have other work to do than the men but it's still if you read proverbs 31 about the virtuous woman she is doing a lot of work and is keeping herself very, very busy doing things. So very active, doing a lot of work, providing clothing for her household, providing the food, the meals. All the work of guiding the house is done by the woman. So men and women alike, uh, Christian men and women alike, especially ought to be very hard workers. So we see here, so you know, with all that being said, we just understand that those are just general teaching in Scripture. I preach entire sermons about that. Jesus responds to Martha because Martha just approaches Jesus and is like, instead of just going to Mary, she goes to Jesus like, hey, you know, she's not doing anything. I'm doing all the work. Can you just tell her, Jesus, please, can you just tell her to come help me, right? Like, like I'm doing all this work by myself. And this, this story reminded me, I, I just preached last week on covetousness, and we looked at Luke chapter 12, where the man, uh, I'll read this for you just real briefly. You could stay in Luke 10. Luke 12, 13, the Bible says, And one of the companies said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Right? So we have another guy going to Jesus saying, Hey, can you, can you talk to my brother? Right? Like you have these people that are having these, these little problems, kind of family problems. Right? This is Martha and her sister Mary. The other one is um, this, this man and his brother saying like, Hey, I've got this problem. Can you just tell him what to do? Can you tell him to do this? Can you tell my sister to do this? And he answered that man and said, and he said unto him, man, who made me a judge or divider over you? And he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And interestingly enough, I think one of the lessons that we're going to get from Luke 10 coincides, it, it, it fits in really nicely 
with Luke chapter 12 with this story uh, where I use that to springboard off into the preaching against covetousness. And this sermon isn't about covetousness, but it is about what's needful. And the title of my sermon is One Thing is Needful. And that was the response that Jesus gave to Martha. Look at verse number 41 there. We're going to see Jesus' response to Martha not getting the help that she needs. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. And those, that's not a bad thing, by the way, either. That being careful and being troubled about many things isn't inherently bad or wicked or sinful or anything like that. She's real busy. She's trying to do a lot of work. But he has to explain things for her. He has to put things in perspective. And this is a rebuke or a correction about priorities is what this is all about. Because he responds and says, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. So Jesus has come to their house, and Jesus is teaching. And if you see that in verse 39, it says, And she has a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. So when Jesus comes to the house, instead of being all worried about making sure everyone's taken care of it, she's going, no, I'm going to listen to what he has to say. I'm going to sit at Jesus' feet, and I'm going to hear what my Lord has for me. I'm going to hear the wisdom of Jesus, and I'm going to receive of his word. And while, yes, there's a lot of things to do, and we always have a lot of cares in this world, a lot of troubles, a lot of things that we can take care of, a lot of work that needs to be done in the house, a lot of work that needs to be done here and there, when there's something that's needful, like hearing the word of Jesus, he's saying, I'm not going to take that away from her. And in fact, Martha probably could have sat down at Jesus' feet also. And in that situation, given who was at her house and what was going on with him teaching, it would have also been appropriate for her just to be like, you know what, this work can wait. I've got all this stuff to do, but you know what, this is needful. That can wait. And you know what the thing is about work, especially work like this and cumbering about and doing all that stuff? It's never done. It's never done. And the work in a house is never, ever, ever done. I always kind of chuckle a little bit when my wife tells me, like, I got caught up on the laundry. I'm like, no, you didn't. Like, you're never caught up on laundry because there is always clothing in the mix somewhere of being soiled and needing cleaning. You know, like, I get it that the laundry baskets may be empty and that things are put away. But, like, you, it, this is, like, so short term. It's just, like, boom, it's right back. And you all know what I'm talking about. And it's the same thing with the dusting and the vacuuming and the cleaning, you know, just all the dishes, all the, all the things, all the work that needs to be done. And here's what I, wanna, I want you to understand. I want you to walk away. It's a very simple sermon. It probably won't be very long this morning. We need to make sure that we prioritize in our life when we have all these other things going on that we don't allow that to distract us so much that we get wrapped up in all the things and forget about that which is needful and get so focused and worried on the side issues and the side work and all this other stuff that we forget the main point. Like, Jesus is coming to our house. We can worry about every, you know, like, like every little detail. And, 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 and it's not to say that you shouldn't provide the best service to Jesus, right? It's not to say that you shouldn't have things in order and ready to go. But at the end of the day, what's the most important? It's not going to be every speck of dust being picked up off the floor as much as it's going to be your heart is ready and your ears are ready to receive what Jesus has for you. That's, that is the most important thing. And this is what we, I think we all will need to retain and remember uh, if you want to, turn real quick to Revelation chapter 2. I'm applying this primarily individually. But even in Revelation chapter 2, we see an example of this corporately as a church, where churches can also get off track, getting busy about, encumbered about all kinds of other business, and they forget about what's really needful and what the most important thing is. And there are a tremendous amount. There's so many churches out there today 
that will have so many activities, all kinds of stuff going on. I mean, you want to know there's stuff going on. You could be at church every single day, and you're going to have potlucks, and you're going to have this, and you're going to have that, and you're going to have all these other things going on. And people are going to be very, very, very busy. And you can dedicate all of your time to this busyness. But it's still, oftentimes, those churches, you know, again, I'm, not, I'm just kind of broad brushing here. No individual church specifically, but so many of them have missed what's needful and just completely forgotten about, no, what, what it, like, what's the most important thing? What is the most needful thing? That's the thing you just, you never want to lose and you never want to forget. We have an exam, we have a sample church just like this in Revelation chapter 2. It's the church of Ephesus. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor. So is this church working? Yeah. He's like, I know your works and your labor. So they're laboring, they're working, right? Thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. So they've got a righteous mindset, a righteous, you know, it's not just like they're, they're extremely liberal, watered down, just allowing a bunch of sin. Look, they, you don't like the, the evil, right? They, they've got the right doctrine. Maybe they've got the right view. They're real busy. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast born, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Again, bringing up, they've labored, 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 and they're not fainting. They're not, they're not, you know, it's not too much for them. They're not just quitting. They're doing tons of work, and he's even recognizing you've done this work in my name. You've done this work for my name's sake. So all of these things, they're, they're positive things. They're good things, and it's not saying that they shouldn't be doing any of these things. It's, it's, it's still a praise report for this church. But verse 4 says this, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. And look at verse number five, how, how serious this is of forgetting the first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. So that first love and the first works are joined together, right? Right? Because they've forgotten their first love, therefore they're not doing the first works. They're doing tons of work. They're doing tons of labor. I mean, they are laboring. But they're not doing the first works. And he says, remember and repent and do those first works or else. Or else what? Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. The candlestick, these are churches in God's eyes. These are churches that God recognizes as being churches that are going to be preaching his word, doing his work. He's saying, I'm going to remove you to where you're not even like a valid church in my eyes anymore if you don't go back and do these first works. And I wonder how many churches are in this condition right now where they may have good doctrine, they may have good teaching, they may be uh, against evil, and they may be doing a lot of work in Jesus' name, but they've forgotten the first works. They pass the verse and well, what's the first works? Well, that's pretty easy. What is the first work? What is the most important thing? What was the most important thing that you've ever done in your entire life? Hopefully you're going to say, it's put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the most important thing in anybody's life. It's more important than marriage. It's more important than the birth of your children. Your soul being saved from eternity in hell is the number one most important thing. And look, spouses, children are extremely important, right? Those are, those are worldly speaking, the most important things. But, you know, spiritually speaking, trumps all of that. And you having that salvation is the number one most important thing. It is the Great Commission. It is a job that's been entrusted to the churches to go forth and preach the gospel unto every creature. Those are going to be the first works. And look, when a church gets started, how is that church going to grow if they're not going out and reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ? You start with, with, with very little. You have to be going out. And look, I could speak by experience. I've started two churches from scratch. 
But look, it's not me. It's, a, it's, it's you know, the Lord that builds the church. But it ain't going anywhere if you're not doing the work. And, and everyone that even started and helped form this church from the very beginning, the reason why the, all the people here, and, and you could testify if you were one of the first members here, you raise your hand and let me know if this is true or say amen, is because this is going to be a soul winning church that's going to go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So all the people that started this, this is what they wanted. They wanted a church where they were going to be sent out. That was the, and that was the first works. You know, that's still the first works, and that's still the primary works that we're going to do. But these are, the, these are the things that churches can lose focus on and lose sight on, especially as you grow. Especially as churches get bigger, it's like, hey, now we can do this and this and this. And you start offering a lot of other things. Look, we offer more activities, too. And we've been offering a little bit more and a little bit more the more people that we get, the bigger we get as a group. Because there's more people willing to volunteer time and do things. It makes sense, right? There's, and there's nothing wrong with those things. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having activities. You know, the, the Bible's not saying here, you need to cut out this activity. And say, no, you're doing these works in my name. Great. Just like Martha... She's serving. She's being a hostess. She's doing good things. There's nothing wrong with, with her coming about and being busy on serving the people that are at her house. They're all good things. But don't allow all of that to cost you the first works. Don't allow all of that to, to then ignore the needful things. Martha was missing the one thing that was needful. And Jesus is like, look, I'm not taking that away from her. She's going to sit here and listen. I'm not going to tell her to go away and go work and do some other meaningless task. She's going to listen. And churches that don't do those first works and, and forget and ignore the meaningful, the needful stuff, not just the meaningful, the needful stuff, you're treading on thin ice. Turn, if you would, to... Turn you to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Book of Ecclesiastes, right after the book of Proverbs. You've got Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. And the reason why I was bringing up earlier that the, with Luke 12 about the, the man that approached Jesus said, man, who made, you know, when Jesus responded, you know, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he was talking about covetousness is because oftentimes one of the big distractions in our lives is going to be the cares of this world. We can get too focused around all of the other work that's going on and then end up letting the needful things just fall by the wayside. And that happens frequently. And as someone who's been in church faithfully for a, a long time now, I mean, I don't even know, 10 years pastoring plus another seven before that of just, I mean, every church service that I'm not ill pretty much being in church so 17 years, I see, a lot, I, I, I see a lot of patterns and I see, you know, over the years and over time, the people who come and go. And just being really involved in church and knowing the people in church and stuff, you kind of see what happens. And it's unfortunate because it, it, it does happen, it's going to happen, but you have to decide for yourself that's not going to happen to you. Right, And you see things come up in people's lives, and sometimes it's a promotion. Sometimes it's, it, it's some other draw that, that then is, is causing that person to get, that was maybe extremely focused on the right things, soul winning, doing, you know, serving the Lord, to then shifting and transitioning to other things. And the other things can be a whole host of other things, right? I mean, uh, oftentimes it's work related, but it can be family related. It can be all kinds of other things that just sort of get you out from really serving God. And then you start to notice people, their church attendance starts slipping and, you know, all the, until pretty much you just don't even see them anymore. And it happens a lot. And I don't want that to happen. I mean, it does. But, and here's the thing, what I'm saying, and you got to understand this too. 
It's not like you just have to have every living, waking moment of your day just being completely like soul winning and praying or something. You can have jobs. You can do other work, right? I mean, and you're going to have to, right? Especially to provide for yourself. You're going you're to have to be able to do other things. So I'm not just like trying to be so radical up here of just saying like you just have to just have nothing and, and you know, and, and do that with your, with your life of just saying, I'm only going to just preach the gospel and that's it ever. And, you know, if you want to do that, that's great. I think, amen. But it's not like God expects that just out of every single person to just have to give up. No, you still have to be able to provide for your family and do things. But you still need to put what's, what's the most important first. Just as much as Martha should still be being a good hostess and, and helping people. But, hey, you know what? When Jesus is there, this is learning time. He showed up. When he leaves, I could go back to doing this other work and stuff. But right now, this is what's needful and this is what's most important. And I'm not going to overlook this aspect. And, you know, I, this is pro one of the reasons I'm probably preaching this is because of what's going on at my house right now. We've got, like, everything's torn up and we're trying to paint and we need to get new floors. There's, like, all these other projects going on. And it, it's, it's a distraction. And it can cause you to, like, go... No, but I need to do this, and I need to get this done, and I need to do this, and I need to do this. But if I do that, then what's going to happen to church? If I say, you know what, I'm just going to not do this stuff. I've got other obligations. And look, some things are more needful. You know what's way more needful? The Word of God. Amen. And teaching the Word of God. Preaching the Word of God is way more needful than the paint changing color or whatever, or the holes being, you know, like... Look, that stuff will get done, but you can't let that become just something that's just going to take you out or, or, or get, you know, just distract you too much. And, and you know, again, that's, that's a little personal thing for me, but whatever it is for you, I'm sure you've got a bunch of other things going on in your life. Maybe even on the weekends, maybe even on Sundays, right? That gets a lot of people out of church. Oh, something comes up, now I can't be in church anymore. Every Sunday. Well... How needful is church to you? You have to decide that for yourself. It's a priority issue. What's more important? I had you turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes does a pretty good job of putting things in perspective for us as, as far as just the things of this world. And it's it's kind of harsh if you think about it, but it's, and, and sometimes it may, it may seem a little depressing, but it's true. And if you look at Ecclesiastes chapter 1, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now look, re you got to read the, all of Ecclesiastes too. So I, I, I don't frequently take verses, like just individual verses out of Ecclesiastes because you do have to get the whole picture. It starts off real bleak, but at the end he's like, look, it's still important, it's still needful, like, Still going to teach people the word of God. I'm still, you know, still going to do some things. But it does drive home this, this point or this aspect. You know, vanity just, it, it means it's empty. It's meaningless. It's just kind of, it's just empty. It's just void. Like vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Verse 3 says, what profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? One generation passeth away and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. The generations come and go and you're going to work and then that's going to be gone and, then, you know, and, and all this stuff. So he's just saying like, in the end, it just seems pretty meaningless. Right? And the work that we do here, we can work real hard and we can build stuff and, and I can work on my house real hard and all this stuff. And then someone else is going to come along and knock the whole thing down, right? And redo something else with the property. It's just kind of like, but I did all this work. We're like, whatever. Right? Who cares? And, and that's, and it, when you think about it, what we do with our lives here, most of what we do, a lot of what we do with our lives, that's just what it's going to be like. It just, it's just kind of like, well, what did I spend so much time working around here for, you know? But you can't just have that total attitude because you still need to provide. So, you know, I work so I can provide for my family, so, you know, so that we can do these things. And ultimately, though, hopefully it's so that you can also serve the Lord, right? You have the resources to serve the Lord. You could. You can do things, uh, but, but we don't want to get wrapped up in these things. Let's keep reading Ecclesiastes 1, verse 5 says, The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to his place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north. 
It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. And the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. And that is an important truth to understand just about us humanly speaking, too. And it comes to labor, right? Hey, all things are full of labor. And it, it, it ain't that the truth, man. Everything that you do is like work. Like you just have to, no matter, even like taking vacations is work, especially if you have like family, right? We're just, we, we just got back from a vacation, a vacation. <laughs> man, that was a lot of work. <laughs> all things have labor. But, but the, the, the latter part is, is more what I want to focus on there. It says the eye is not satisfied with seeing or the ear filled with hearing. And these distractions and this labor and the things that you can do, you can just keep working and working and working and working, but you're never really satisfied. You're never going to really be like, oh, yeah, I've worked enough. There's always more work to do. There's always more jobs to do. Like I think of my secular job. I work in IT. I, I will always have things to do, always. There's, the job is never, ever done. Like there's never going to come a day is, uh, un, until I get fired or I quit where it's going to be like, yeah, you know what? There's actually nothing to do. And, and honestly, like when, when you're working hard, you ought to have that mindset of just saying, you know, there's always is work to do and you always find work to do. And just stand around and be lazy and be idle. And make sure that you get work to do. But at the same time, don't get so engrossed and wrapped up into that secular work where it's just like you, you've now lost sight of what's needful. You've forgotten about the most important thing and the most important aspect about life. Uh, jump down to verse number 13. The Bible says, And I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of men, sons of man, to be exercised therewith. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. At the end of the day, he's just kind of like summing this up. Everything, all this work that you do under the sun. He's talking about the physical labor because he references like I had manservants and maidservants and he talks about he built these great works and he built fountains and he had gardens and he built all these things that like you can build humanly speaking just on this earth. He had all these great works and accomplishments. And at the end of the day, you know, he says it's vanity. It's just vexation of spirit. There's tons of labor in it, but... It's, it's really just meaningless. And at the end of the day, what do you get but just beholding it with your eyes? And we want to maintain the right mindset, right? And turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 6. We want to maintain this right mindset so that we don't ever get too clingy to the things of this world. When you just remember, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, a, at the end of the day, it's kind of all meaningless, but it doesn't mean life is meaningless. Now, it is. Life is meaningless to those who don't know Christ. It's truly meaningless. Because at the end of the day, what do you got? You got nothing. You know, we're born in this world with nothing, and we leave with nothing in this world, like of this world. You come and you go, and there's, there's nothing. Eternity matters more than anything. And the reason why our lives aren't meaningless is because you can still have an impact on people's souls. And not just their eternal destination, but also the rewards that God gives for your service in your life in this world. And the service is service to him, but also service to man too. You walk in, in Christ's steps, and he's, God's going to reward you for that. And you might suffer in this life, and you might suffer loss, and you might suffer the loss of your goods, and you might not be in, in the highest position that you could possibly be in if you were to dedicate your life to doing those things. But who cares about that? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter, right? This is, this is what the Bible teaches. Like this stuff, hey, there's no end to the work, but you know, at the end of the day, it's all vanity. 
so what? You could build some great empire here on earth. Who cares? First of all, God's in charge, so if God wants to just topple your empire, it could be done in a minute. But even if he chooses not to do that, it's still just, just give it a generation or two. Whatever, right? Like, like it, time will take care of it. It's all going to come to naught. And even if it survives past your lifespan, your life is over. So what, is that, what good is, is that empire going to do you in the afterlife? Nothing at all. That's not going to save you. You can't barter with the empire you built with God to save your soul. So this, this is what I mean when I say that it's, you know, life becomes kind of meaningless. If you don't have Christ, if you don't have the word of God, if you don't have the Lord, your, your life ultimately becomes meaningless. You can do meaningful things in your life. You raise family and things like that. But at the end of the day, you've got this short time. And if you end up just dying and going to hell, oh man, you missed it. You missed that which was needful and wasted all your time on the things that aren't. You're in Matthew chapter 6, look at verse number 24. This is the mindset. I think we need to hear this on a regular basis. I preach on this on a regular basis. Matthew 6 is one of my favorite passages to help us keep perspective, to help us regularly to reprioritize priorities in your life. Make sure that you've got what ought to be at the top at the top, which is the Lord, right? Even the Ten Commandments is, I am the Lord your God, thou should have no other gods before me. And the second is talking about not having any idols, and we don't want to have anything that would be taking the place of God. And if you have something else that's number one in your life that's not God, Essentially, that's an idol that's taking the place of because God deserves and demands the number one place in your life. He created you. He, he, he bought you with a price. He gave the, the, his only begotten son to shed his blood and die on the cross for you. He did everything for you. He gives you your breath. He gives you your being. He's given you everything. He deserves the number one spot. In your life absolutely and when you go and put other things other people other things in front of that now you've you've um, you've lowered the status of God and oftentimes I think people do it unintentionally you're not thinking I'm gonna lower the status of God in my life right because you know it, it may sound like I'm saying that but that's not what I'm saying people people do this but through their actions, that is what they're doing. And when you start putting everything else first and you just go, well, you know what? Maybe if there's enough time, I'll go to church. Well, maybe it'll work out this time. Maybe if there's enough time, I can squeeze five minutes in of Bible reading in. Well, I'm kind of tired tonight. Well, I've got too many other things to do today. Okay, when you start using all of those reasons, I'll call them excuses, to not have even the most simple, basic relationship with the Lord your God, meaning hearing from his word, speaking to him, right, through prayer, and, and attending the gathering of believers, which, by the way, is also a commandment of the Lord, That we're not like those that forsake the assembling of themselves together. Hey, we're doing a really, really good Bible memory passage, Hebrews chapter 10. And if you don't have a priority on coming to church and making sure you're coming to church regularly. Now, look, I'm not saying you have to come to every service that we offer you. I think it's a good thing to do. I think you'd be blessed by that. But if you're not coming regularly to church, you're forsaking the assembling and you should memorize. It's, it's, I think we're like right up to that passage too. Yeah. Just past it. I was going to say, we're, we're right there at that point. So, so learn the verses from last week. Learn the verses from this week because it also is in context with last week's. And 
memorize that, right? And understand the importance of church attendance and just having God number one in your life. Look at verse number 24, Matthew chapter 6. The Bible says, No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And, and again, what that's talking about is how you're spending your life. What are you, what are you, ser what are you serving? Wh who are you working for? What are you doing with your life? Are you just trying to make money? Like, to make, like, like that's my goal is I just want to make money. Then you can't serve God. If your goal is to make money, you can't serve God. But if your goal is to serve God, then you can't serve money. It doesn't mean you can't earn money to support your family, you just, but that's not going to be your goal. Like that won't be your ambition, and you might not make it as high up the corporate ladder as you might like to, because in order to do that, you have to make that your, your goal, and it becomes your life. And I'll tell you what, of the CEOs that I've known, they work a lot, a lot of hours. A lot, and the bigger the business, the more is going to be expected of you, and people are going to have to be ambitious for that work. And again, I'm not saying you can't be a CEO and serve God. I'm not saying that, but you have to have it in your mind. What do I want to do with my life? How am I going to prioritize things? And you choose for yourself. And if you can be a CEO and still serve the Lord and not forget those things are needful, then amen. Right? Great. There's nothing wrong with that, just like there's nothing wrong with Martha doing this other work, but you know what? Don't forget what's needful. Amen. And don't get so focused on the mammon and putting that as your goal that, well, now you're not serving God. And the Bible's saying, look, it's one or the other. And really, at the end of the day, you got to choose the priority in your life. Am I going to serve God or am I going to serve money? If you're going to serve God, then who cares about the money? If you're going to serve God, you, you understand already. Who cares about the money? It doesn't matter. It's meaningless. It's vanity. Amen. Vanity of vanities. It, it, it means nothing. Yet all you need to have is enough to be able to, to be clothed and fed and survive. Right? At the end of the day, that's really all you need is just to be able to survive, to live another day, to keep serving the Lord and to make sure that your family is provided for. It doesn't mean you have to make sure that your family all has iPads. Seriously. Yeah. I mean, I mean, really. It doesn't mean that, that doesn't mean like, oh, you're a deadbeat dad because your son doesn't have an iPhone. Pfft. No. They've got clothing and they've got food. Yeah. They even have shelter. You're providing. It's not, it may not, it doesn't have to be luxurious. But when you and it doesn't mean you can't have more than that, right? So like just just get the picture. But when you're serving the Lord, you have just, you're, you're going to be content with however you're blessed in this life. It doesn't matter, right? Because you're not going to just focus on, on just earning tons of money. You're going to support yourself. You're going to support your family. But number one in your life is going to be the Lord. Verse number 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on, is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, Let, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature, and why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin, and yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And Solomon had been like the richest person to that point. Like he, he's had, God gave him the wisdom and the riches. I mean, he had anything that you could ever want. Read Ecclesiastes. He talks about all the things that he had. And all, you know, it's like he could literally have any type of garment that he ever could possibly want. All the types of colors, all the beauty, whatever. And the Bible's saying like, that still doesn't compare to the way that God clothed the grass with the beauty of the flowers and the beauty of, of his creation. And he's like, why do you care about it so much? And yet I say unto you, even Solomon in his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, of ye, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, 
saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. And here's where that great faith is going to need to come in. Because we know we need to eat, and we know that we need to be clothed, and we know that we need to have these basic provisions to live and survive. But even that stuff, God saying, you know, first he's saying, don't worry about all the riches and stuff. You can't serve God and money. And then the stuff that you actually do need, he's saying, don't even worry about that. That's a little harder. It's easier to not care about the luxury stuff. But then it's like, well, how am I not supposed to care about this stuff? Well, you need to have faith. Because he says this, verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. God wants us focusing day by day on serving him. Right? You still could do your job, you still work, but we are seeking first the kingdom of God. That's the priority. That is the 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 what is number one. We're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So, you know, all these other things will be added unto you. You don't have to worry about that stuff. If you seek first the kingdom of God, you don't have to worry about food, you don't have to worry about clothing. I'll take care of you. Just like I took care of the grass, just like I'll take care of the birds, just like I'll take care of any other uh, creature in nature, I'll take care of you, but I'll take care of you. You just seek me first. Seek the kingdom of God. And then he's saying, you know, all these worries, all these cares, right? You're careful about so much. You have all this stuff to do. Take no thought for the morrow. Don't worry about it. Don't get all stressed out about over everything else you have to do. Just live your day. We don't know how many days we have on this earth, right? Don't, don't fret over the amount of work that you have to do, it doesn't help anything. Know that if you're seeking first the kingdom of God, he's going to care for you anyways. So what's the point of getting stressed out and fretting over this stuff? And, you know, hey, take no thought for the morrow. The morrow tomorrow's going to take care of the thoughts of itself. Like, like when you wake up tomorrow, believe me, there'll be plenty of things <laughs> that you're going to need to face and need to do. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Keeping this mindset, especially during the times of year that we get busy, when the distractions come up, don't lose sight of what's needful. Keep the most important things at the forefront. Keep serving God and make, and you know what, if that hasn't been a priority, and I'll challenge you just to do this, evaluate your life, your day-to-day -day life, okay? And, and I want you to decide, and I want you to think honestly just in your own mind, what place does the Lord have in your life? And I'm not asking for an emotional response because everyone's going to just immediately say, God's number one in my life. Is that reflected in your actions on a daily basis? Just, and, and whatever that means to you, okay? You be the judge. I'm not going to tell you how much time that you need to do on this or that or that to, to say that now you can say God is number one in your life. I can't say that. You say that for yourself. Now, I'll challenge you on other things throughout the year to spend more time doing different things. But that's not to prove that God is number one. You, you make sure you're good with that in your life for yourself. And take a serious look and say, is there a day that, I mean, think about this. I, I would at least say this much. I'm not going to tell you how much you need to do, but if you can, if there's a day that you wake up and you have zero thoughts towards the Lord, I mean zero, no prayer, no reading, no, I mean nothing, nothing where God doesn't even cross your mind. He is not number one in your life. He is not number one in your life. Guaranteed. Because think about what's number one. What, what you might say is number one. If, if your wife's number one, you're going to be thinking about your wife. Your husband's number one, you're going to be thinking about your husband. You're going to be doing something for them. You're going you're gonna to communicate with them. If your job is number one, you're showing up to work. You're going to be thinking about your work. And if, if your job is really number one, you're probably going to be thinking about your work over the weekend too when you're not working. 
It doesn't even have to be number one to do that, but I'm just saying, like, if, 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 like whatever's number one in your life, that's where your heart, that's where your mind is going to be. Evaluate for yourself and then make the change necessary and be like, you know what, I think I might have my priorities out of whack. I need to change something, and I need to do it, and I need to make sure I'm doing this every day. And it can be something small. You could start small. Just say, you know what, if I don't read my Bible every day, I'm going to make sure I just carve out time that cannot get moved. That nothing else takes precedence over this time right here. That this is going to be the time that I am making sure that I am spending time with the Lord because God is number one in my life. And you make those decisions and you stick to them. And, and I recommend doing those things in the morning because in the morning, you're starting the day. So no matter what happens the rest of the day, you could just make sure I've already put God first. And, and, and I, I, you know, if my whole day goes sideways and all kinds of weird stuff happens, I don't have to say, well, I can't, I can't do this now. I can't pray or I can't read my Bible, whatever, whatever it is, right? Because all this other stuff. Put them first. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for loving us. We thank you for saving us. God, um, you truly deserve the number one spot in our hearts and in our minds. I pray that you would please help us not to get wrapped up and caught up in the distractions and the cares of this world that, that ultimately will just end up choking us out. But, but help us to reevaluate our time, reevaluate our life just regularly so we don't uh, backslide. We, we could catch ourselves and, and stay focused on serving you. God, we thank you for your promises. We thank you for caring for us. Lord, we love you. I pray that you please heal all those who are not well in our church and um, Lord, especially those who are dealing with, with extremely uh, difficult challenges in their life with, uh, with cancers and other, and other severe uh, illnesses and, and, and issues, dear Lord. And uh, just help our church to, to, to grow and to thrive. And Lord, lead us, be, be the shining light for us every day of our life. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.